Good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you all for being part of this panel on um, uh, lessons learned from uh, uh, state and local government uh, cumulative impacts permitting experience. Um, and this is a, um, a session I think that uh, is long a long time coming. Um, so the issue of cumulative impacts uh, is uh, seen as truly tra a, tr a truly transformative issue for environmental justice and environmental protection overall. Uh, in fact, many see it as the holy grail of environmental justice. Overburdened communities across the country, uh, which have been disproportionately burdened uh, by the by concentrated environmental impacts and noxious land uses, are saying no more. Uh, for many communities, the flashpoint of these issues revolve around environmental permitting. Therefore, it is a real honor and privilege uh, for me to be able to moderate this panel today. The panelists here are key players uh, in three history-making developments for environmental justice, cumulative impacts, and, and facility permitting. Not only do they represent uh, three key developments, uh, I will submit that they in fact represent three important pathways for, de uh, uh, for developing um, uh, solutions and st strategies and solutions for addressing cumulative impacts in environmental permitting. Their stories begin to offer critical lessons for what makes for successful collective strategy and action to incorporate cumulative impacts in governmental decision making. So if you can bring up the slide, I wanted to kind of give a little bit of a historical perspective on this. Um, great. Thank you. So this uh, slide comes from an article I wrote for the Environmental Law Reporter in um, uh, 2021. Uh, and it kind of begin to think about, for me at least, to think about the fact that when we talk about environmental justice, there are multiple decision contexts that require uh, different types of uh, analysis, different scales and degrees of quantification. Uh, and that, um, in fact, um, uh, and 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 so uh, for different types of decisions, and those different types of decisions are uh, identified here uh, along this continuum in terms of uh, things like outreach and analysis, or resource allocation, uh, permitting, uh, rules, uh, standard setting, etc. Um, and so the first thing I wanted to say is that we. We already have been using uh, cumulative impact assessment to uh, significantly in influence or inform uh, governmental decision making, and that comes with um, uh, 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 with Cal EPA's Cal Enviro screen, um, and I wanted to recognize them uh, because of their role, um, which um, in um, this. Um, uh, continuum of development around cumulative impact analysis. Uh, there's a, there, uh, the Cal Enviro screen uh, tool is in fact uh, helping to inform many other developments, uh, including, I think as you will hear from Megan, the, uh, the current efforts in uh, Chicago uh, around the cumulative impact assessment. However, the really difficult part of this is to start to move uh, into the reg uh, um, no, so let me back up. So Cal Enviro Screen has been used to, to inform um, uh, uh, the uh, allocation resources and the ways that we can prioritize uh, program uh, attention and delivery. And so, um, uh, and so this has been now being used to inform uh, the allocation of not only not not just millions but billions of dollars. Um, so, but the hard part of, for, for this issue is moving into the regulatory space. And now we are beginning to see uh, developers in that uh, beginning in 2008 with the Minnesota's cumulative levels and effects law and development of protocols, um, which you will hear about, um, New Jersey's landmark law and regulations, which was uh, uh, the law which was passed in 2020, and the Chicago Department of Public Health uh, RMG General Iron Health Impact Assessment in 2022. And so uh, we are going to hear uh, speakers uh, talk to these today. And um, like I said, I hope this begins to give us a basis to start a conversation about what makes for um, successful strategy uh, um, and collective action uh, in 
in incorporating cumulative impacts into government decision making. So with that, uh, I want to turn it over to uh, Deputy Commissioner Sean Moriarty um, from New Jersey DEP, uh, who helped to spearhead the development of regulations for the landmark New Jersey cumulative impact law, which is the first law in the nation that requires mandatory denial of a permit if a new facility uh, will a disproportionate impact and already overburdened community. If you watch the uh, voluminous uh, recordings of all the public engagement sessions that Sean has conducted, you will not only learn a lot, but I, but you will marvel, as I have, at his mastery of environmental law and regulations, his commitment to transparency, and his intense dedication to be true to the lived experience of communities. Sean? Well, thank you, Charles. Um, that is quite flattering. Um, I can't believe you watched all of those presentations. Um, I didn't even want to have to go back and watch them. So I'm going to share my screen um, and go through this and really appreciate the opportunity to be here um, to discuss this today. Um, so as, as, as Charles indicated, um, in September of 2020, um, Governor Murphy, um, Governor Phil Murphy from, the New, from New Jersey, um, signed the, um, the state's environmental justice law, which we think, you know, the first of its kind and really a landmark change um, in environmental law in the state of New Jersey. And, um, you know, we now, as of um, August of this year, have officially proposed and adopted the regulations to put those rules in place. Um, and it's a obviously a huge, huge accomplishment for us. Um, and we're very, very proud to be part of this movement um, among the states and with and with the federal government um, to begin to address um, cumulative impacts in our in our overburdened communities, low income communities, and communities of color generally. Um, so, you know, where the, the rules are really premised, and and we'll talk a little bit about the data that we have, but our data shows that New Jersey's low income communities and communities of color have historically been subjected to um, a disproportionately high number of environmental and public health stressors. That includes things like mobile sources of air pollution, um, as well as numerous stationary sources of pollution while also facing um, deficits in open space, um, quality green space, tree canopy, adequate stormwater management, you know, all the things that some of us um, who don't live in, in overburdened communities um, likely take for take for granted um, on our in our daily lives. So what we're able to do under the regulations and as empowered by the statute um, is conduct a comparative analysis to assess how certain facilities seeking permits to construct or operate in overburdened communities will contribute to environmental or public health stressors in that community in a manner that is disproportionate when compared to its neighbors. That's my that's my shorthand of it. Um, in conducting this comparative analysis, the law now empowers the department to consider environmental and public health stressors on a facility-wide basis. And that allows us to include elements that were not previously subject to certain of the department's media-based regulatory schemes. Most notable on this are mobile sources of emissions, mobile sources of air pollution, um, those that, that often result in, in um, PM 2.5 and other particularly concerning um, pollutants in these neighborhoods and as as we've seen as we've gone through this analysis from a data perspective is that you know those levels are are higher and and the concerns related to the to those exposures are abundant in our overburdened communities so really to that end the ej law enhances our existing authorities um, and allows us to look much more broadly um, at a facility when we are engaging in permitting and this is obviously um, a big step forward um, from an authority perspective um, to allow us to really get at some of the issues that are affecting our overburdened communities. So as we go through the rulemaking, I think it's important um, to ground ourselves in the legislative intent. Um, and as you can see, it's expressed in the findings on the screen. Um, what these findings really speak to um, is a legacy of inequitable siting of pollution generating facilities in low income communities and communities of color. Um, that it also speaks to the need to more equally share the burdens of our state's economic development and then the need to correct this historic injustice through meaningful public engagement and under appropriate circumstances, placing limits on the construction of new and the operations of existing facilities. So that last part, the public engagement part and, and the placing of limits or conditions on, on these types of facilities, including um, in certain situations, denying um, permit applications for new facilities, that's where the rules really focus. That's, the, that's really um, the action we take under the rules. So um, we really wanna kind of start um, with, with applicability, right? So um, while the law is extremely powerful, it's important to understand exactly where it applies. And we look at three criteria for that. First, the facility in question must be located in an overburdened community. 
those are defined by the statute as being um, census block groups, a very finite um, unit of, of census data as being block groups that have 35% um, households that qualify as low income, 40% of residents that identify as minority or members of state recognized tribal community, um, or at least 40 percent of the households have limited English proficiency. So that's that's the basis of our analysis as looking at those overburdened communities. Then we consider whether the facility in question is one of the eight types of facilities um, listed in the law. Now those are mostly focused on um, large sources of air pollution, so your Title V, your your major sources of air pollution, as well as you know the numerous types of solid waste facilities. Uh, uh, and as we've seen, these are in particularly New Jersey. Um, are are often located in overburdened communities, um, and then you know considering other um, other kind of uh, sewage treatment plants. So that's kind of our universe of facilities, and then we're considering as the third criteria whether it requires a permit. And that permit is basically almost any any individual permit from the department. Those individual permits being the ones that require some kind of a deeper level of analysis. Um, from the, from the department's perspective, we have general permits and permits by rule and certain certain of our. Um, certain of our regulatory schemes, but anywhere where a facility is required to obtain an individual permit um, that requires a more detailed review, in those situations, the department is empowered to review um, that facility under environmental justice regulations. So those are your three criteria. Um, what's kind of important to, to kind of note here um, is that the law excludes authorizations or approvals necessary to perform remediation. So you know, it doesn't it doesn't work at you know as some would some would claim cross purposes of actually addressing some of the um, the legacy environmental um, contamination um, in these communities. It does not interfere in quotes um, with the ability to remediate these properties. It really focuses on what is the end end use of a potential remediated property, and we want, don't want to um, continue the status quo of having properties kind of remediated to some to some extent, capped, and then turned into solid waste facilities. After, they, after their previous industrial use. That's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid to, the continuation of those inequities. Um, it also um, it also excludes minor modifications to major source air permits that do not incre increase emissions. So there is some flexibility here um, for continued operations. But um, what I also want to note here in terms of applicability is the rules apply to new facilities, um, expansions of existing facilities, and renewals of, the, of our major source permits, so our Title V permits only. Um, so, um, if you if it's an existing facility that doesn't have a Title V permit, even if it um, even if it is one of the facilities covered by the law, and if it's seeking renewal of an operating permit that's below that Title V threshold, it is not going to ultimately be subject to the environmental justice regulations. So, um, let's talk about what what these overburdened communities look like in the state of New Jersey. You can see on the map um, they're broken down by um, by you know how they meet the different um, statutory criteria. Um, the important thing to note here is that. Um, it covers about 4.5 million people in the state of New Jersey um, live within communities to, identified as overburdened communities by the statute. That's about half of our population. Um, we continue to identify um, and update those, those maps. We'll be updating them um, on a yearly basis as new census data comes out. We want to make sure that we're using the most current data. But at present, um, through, our, through the development of our EJ mapping tool or EJ map, um, we're able to to show the 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 location of all of the overburdened communities in the state, as well as individual stressor levels, which we'll discuss in a in a in a minute as we move forward here. So this this EJ map, and I encourage folks you know uh, who have spent any time with um, CalViro Screen or um, or uh, EPA's tools or any other tool to to check our tool out. We're we're really proud of it. We think it does a lot, and it really does provide the baseline um, for the analysis that we need to conduct under the environmental justice regulations. So as we move move forward, what we're really talking about um, is an identification and assessment of environmental and public health stressors. So the, the statute gives us these broad categories. We talk about environmental stressors. Those are concentrated source air pollution, mobile sources, contaminated sites, transfer stations, point sources, as well as um, public health stressors, which, which could be defined as conditions that may cause public health impacts. And that those things include asthma, cancer, elevated blood lead levels, cardiovascular disease, um, developmental problems. So two, two um, important notes here. First, um, it's always notable to me, and I do, I do uh, mention this every time, the presence of specific facilities. So those facilities that are covered by the regulations, those transfer stations and other solid waste facilities, those by the law are considered in and of themselves to be stressors. As we go through our analysis, we look for, you know, effectively an abundance of those stressors or those facilities in a given community on a, from a density perspective to determine whether that is an actual adverse stressor. But the presence of those facilities when in abundance as compared to the neighbors um, is 
are by themselves considered a stressor, separate and apart from the other impacts that they might have on um, the environmental and um, public health conditions in those specific communities. The second piece to point out here is when we talk about um, public health stressors. One thing that we pushed for in the, in the law and we were fortunate to get is language um, is the may cause language, right? So that what that allows us to do is use present conditions um, in those in the data we have on present conditions in communities to kind of um, extrapolate into looking at things like asthma rates or cancer rates. It's very difficult for us um, in the state of New Jersey to access um, Department of Health data on say asthma levels or asthma rates in a given community at the block group level um, due to suppression issues, um, HIPAA issues, all of these other kind of privacy concerns. It's very difficult to use that information on that level. So we, by using the may cause language, we're able to really more effectively, we think, get at issues like, chasm, at, like um, asthma and cancer rates um, in ways that we would not be able to if we were using that health specific data. So that's, um, that's been our, our approach here. Um, as we went through the rules, um, you know, then you have to kind of, you know, fill out that definition. We have to determine what stressors are we going to use um, to to make this assessment. So we started with a with a broad list, sixty plus stressors. Looked at the other um, available data. We looked at EPA. We looked at California. Kind of narrowed that list down and landed on twenty six stressors. Um, in doing so, we looked at the alignment with the categories in EJ rule again: concentrated source of air pollution, density, asthma, all of that stuff. The availability, um, quality, and the ability of of our ability to use publicly available data at the appropriate geographic scale was kind of the second um, thing we looked at. So you need to have, you know, data that everyone can use, um, that everyone can access, and that can be used reliably um, and 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 repeatedly at the block group level in order to be sufficient to make a regulatory decision. Again, regulatory decisions being um, something that that are held to a higher bar than simply using it for a screening method. We really had to be careful in, cho in choosing those stressors. The second thing we did was look at marginal value. Um, we wanted to, to make sure that, you know, we could add stressor upon stressor upon stressor. We wanna make sure that the stressors that we added were meaningful. And ultimately our stated goal here was to use the minimum number of stressors necessary to accurately assess environmental and public health conditions in the OVC. Um, when we're putting the regulations together, when we're asking applicants and ultimately asking community members to, um, to, to make a reasonable assessment of impacts and to, to be able to articulate concerns, um, if we had a hundred stressors, we were concerned that that was going to become even more overwhelming and probably already will be for some folks. So we wanted to make it um, tight, reliable, and ultimately implementable from a regulatory perspective. So in the PowerPoint, um, which you know we always share um, post this and is available on our website, we list all the specific stressors so you can kind of see that. I won't go through them given time, but you know you can see that we're using things like PM 2.5, we're using things like cancer risk, we're considering traffic, um, we are considering um, you know surface water impairments. Um, density of facilities, we mentioned that being a stressor. We're looking at contaminated sites, we're looking at drinking water, potential lead exposures. We're looking at other things. We talked about deficits earlier. We're looking at lack of recreation space, lack of tree canopy, um, flooding, an abundance of a impervious cover. And then we're also looking at kind of, you know, our social determinants. Um, we're using employment and education um, as being um, key determinants in that, in that situation. So now that we've had kind of an opportunity to discuss what the stressors are, um, we got to kind of talk about how do you compare them, right? Um, so, you know, I've, I've kind of termed it the neighbors um, from a more technical and regulatory perspective, we call it the geographic point of comparison. And the statute gives us is discretion to determine what the appropriate geographic point of comparison is. And what we ultimately ended on, landed on was a hybrid approach, which we felt was really the most protective thing. If you use, so what we're doing here um, in terms of comparing to um, an overburdened community to a non-overburdened community is considering the lower of any individual or cumulative stressor levels um, at the county or state average or 50th percentile of the non-overburdened communities. So what we're doing is comparing conditions in overburdened communities to those not considered overburdened by the legislature and then making determinations um, based off of that. So for each of the stressors that we've identified and ultimately kind of our combined stressor total um, at the end of the day, um, each of those is provided a value and then you compare it to the state or county for that individual stressor or combined stressor total. If it's higher, it's considered adverse. And then we kind of sum up the adverse stressors and then the, the rules kind of take you through um, different um, different avenues depending on whether the stressors are adverse and whether ultimately a particular overburdened community is subject to adverse cumulative stressors. So let's talk about those terms um, quickly. So an adverse stressor, as we indicated, is a stressor that's higher than geographic point of comparison. So you're lower of county, of county or state, non-overburdened communities at the 50th percentile. That's for an individual stressor. Um, a facility's combined stressor total 
um, is the total count of adverse stressors in an OBC. So we said we started with, with 26 total stressors. If you went through all those individual stressors, did the comparison, and then totaled up the number of adverse stressors, that's your combined stressor total. So in the example we have here, 18 of the 26 stressors um, were considered higher. So then that, that combined stressor total is 18. We then take the combined stressor total, we compare that number to the lower of state or county to determine whether the specific block group is subject to adverse cumulative stressors. So where the OBC's um, combined stressor total is higher than the geographic point of comparison, it's considered to be subject to adverse cumulative stressors. So in our example, the OBC with a combined stressor total of 18, where the geographic point of comparison lower of state or county is 13, and this is, I believe it is the state, um, the OBC is considered to be subject to adverse cumulative stressors. The point of doing all of this is to take that big list of overburdened communities, that 4.5 million people, that 3,500 block groups, and really try to focus on the areas in the state that are most subject to adverse cumulative stress, that are really the most stressed communities, right? So that's how we kind of take that big that big list, that four 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 and four and a half million people, and kind of try to narrow it down to make sure that we're focusing on the communities most in need, um, because frankly, the definition is fairly broad um, from a regulatory perspective. Um, so when we receive a permit application, um, what, we ulti what we'll ultimately be doing for applicants and for community members is providing them with baseline information. And that what that is, is pulling from EJMAP, um, our publicly available mapping tool with all of the data on the stressors in it. It'll let the, everyone, it'll provide a baseline of information for the analysis that everyone can understand. Um, that would identify those stressors. It would look at the ge what the ge geographic point of comparison is. It would identify the adverse stressors, provide the, com the combined stressor total, and then it would indicate whether that community is subject to adverse cumulative stressors. If it's subject to adverse cumulative, there's like there is um, more process within the regulations. If it's not subject to adverse cumulative stressors, um, our regulations focus on ensuring that it remains that way. That we're not by um, protecting by providing more protections to the adverse block groups. That we're not then ignoring additional um, environmental burdens placed on the block groups that are not yet adverse. Um, that's you know we don't want to be at cross purposes, obviously, um, in doing that. So. The goal of our process, right? The goal of all of this, this imperative analysis, is to avoid what we term um, to be um, disproportionate impacts. Um, so it's really to avoid contributions to adverse stressors or to create adverse stressors that would be higher um, than the average, right? So we want to make sure that we're not contributing to where there's already an adverse and we're not creating new adverse stressors. Um, where a facility cannot avoid a disproportionate impact, we then require them to propose measures to minimize their contributions to stressors or to provide, in certain circumstances, a net environmental benefit. What's, what's critical here from a, from a regulatory perspective and as we look at um, you know, what our conditions are going to be is that we're following in all instances and on individual stressors and avoid first, then minimize, and then under certain circumstances provide benefit. We're not allowing for offsets. We're not considering de minimis um, contributions. We're not saying, well, I, you know, we're not allowing a facility to say, well, I reduced all these stressors, but I raised PM 2.5 and therefore you know, on balance, I'm doing better. That's not the approach here. The approach is very um, stressor specific and requires an, an analysis of contributions to each of those stressors and measures to avoid, minimize, and in certain situations, provide that benefit. Um, so how do we get to, you know, kind of get to a decision and how do we engage um, with the communities? Um, that's through the development of an environmental justice impact statement and what we've termed um, quite, um, quite purposefully meaningful public participation. We want to really be able to um, you know, rhetorically separate that from public participation that folks have um, likely engaged in with the department in the past and found to be um, insufficient. We want to make sure that folks understand that this needs to be meaningful and direct, right? So the EGIS, or the Environmental Justice Impact Statement, it assesses the public stressors um, in the facility drawing from that baseline information, excuse me, um, and it looks at the measures that the facility would propose to avoid or minimize those contributions, right? So it takes the baseline information, it analyzes the facility's operations and potential contributions, and then it asks a facility to propose measures. That information is then provided to the public um, and addressed as part of a public hearing held by the ultimately by the applicant in the overburdened community to walk through that information. Um, public notice in multiple forms. Um, we've also um, one of the things that we we struggled with a little bit was how do you um, how do you address community specific needs um, with regard to uh, with regard to notice and and to really ensure access, right? It was really critical to us. So rather than attempt to list out a hundred different things we thought a facility should do to try to capture everything, what we're really asking facilities to do is to know their communities and develop community specific methods to engage, whether that is engaging with a specific community group, whether that is 
um, providing notice through um, through a local uh, religious institution or otherwise. We really want applicants to, to, to meet their communities, to talk to them and find out the best way to access them. Appropriate languages, appropriate methods to make sure that the people in the community know what is going on. Um, minimum 60 day public comment period, applicants are responded, are required to respond to all relevant public comments on writing. So we're creating a robust record of environmental justice impact statement. We have public comments and then we have responses to that. That's the record upon which um, the department ultimately make a decision. And that decision is where where's the rubber hits the road. So we have had these regulations in place for approximately two months. We have yet to have to issue um, a decision under the environmental justice uh, regulations. We're, we're eager to, um, we're ready to apply these to apply these um, these standards, but we've not yet um, had, a, had, a, had an application that goes through the process. So um, from the department side, um, once we have this information, we consider the environmental justice impact statement, testimony, written comments, um, and determine whether the facility can avoid a, avoid a disproportionate impact. Where it can avoid a disproportionate impact, so it's not contributing to adverse stressors or it's not creating new adverse stressors, we would impose permit conditions necessary to ensure that that disproportionate impact remains avoided. So in most instances, a permit application that comes through this process is going to result um, in the imposition of, of certain um, conditions, um, regardless of what its impacts are. Now, the more challenging situation is gonna be where a facility cannot avoid a disproportionate impact. So um, it's an existing facility, it's intending to expand where we don't have the right to deny those applications, we can only deny for new applications. Um, what are we gonna do? So for new applications where there's a, a um, disproportionate impact, um, we deny that application unless it serves a compelling public interest in the urban community. That gonna be a, that's gonna be a very narrow exception. For expanded facilities or major source renewals where we are only empowered as the, as the department to condition those, we're gonna need to authorize the applicant to proceed um, subject to appropriate conditions to address facility impacts, right? So those that's where we get into um, what those conditions look like. So for renewals, we're looking again for avoidance and then minimization where avoidance is not feasible um, to contributions to stressors in the OVC. For new or expanded facilities where you're, you know, you're gonna, by, by operation of the facility, um, beyond avoidance and minimization as those first two prongs, we're gonna consider additional feasible conditions that will reduce offsite stressors or provide a net environmental benefit that improves baseline environmental or public health stressors in the overburden community, right? So you're gonna get your full avoidance to the maximum extent feasible, then you're gonna get minimization um, for these types of facilities. And then we're also gonna ask for more. We're also gonna ask for more to improve conditions in the communities. Um, we heard a lot from industry um, and frankly, from our own folks, um, the need for um, specific standards related to your stationary sources, right? So, you know, we have all of this, you know, this body of law under the Air Pollution Control Act, under the Clean Air Act that addresses kind of, you know, from a technological perspective, like what are facilities that have kind of um, stationary stores, what are they required to do um, to manage their emissions? So what we did here was we kind of modeled off that, something kind of uh, similar to the state of the art, um, the state of the art standard um, to provide specific and what we hope are objective standards for those major source components to um, really look at what techno technology they have to feasibly um, reduce their emissions. So in certain situations, we might be asking for emissions um, to be reduced below levels that would have otherwise been considered in the past to be protective of public health. We want to drive those down as far as possible. It might make, mean um, you know, reducing some, some of your um, allowable um, emissions. It might involve um, you know, taking certain outdated things out of permits to really kind of reduce the footprint, um, reduce the environmental footprint of a given facility. And we hope over a, you know, a certain you know, cycle of renewals, um, cycle of, of permitting, We'll be able to continue to kind of um, lower environmental impacts and ultimately remove, um, hopefully, some of the communities in our state that are considered overburdened at present, right, or that are subject to those adverse cumulative stresses. We're going to bring all of those levels down. So, um, as we talked about, compelling public interest has always been, you know, keep a key point, and particularly for our advocacy community, something they really want to focus on because, um, you know, and I think what we recognized is this is the potential to to create a, a huge loophole um, in the regulations. Uh, it, it it's subject to uh, to mischief. Uh, if not done right. So really what we wanted to do um, is create a narrow exception to the requirement that a new facility be denied where it cannot avoid a, a disproportionate impact. So where we define that um, is to really focus on um, essential environmental health safety needs of individuals in the overburdened community. Um, and then we look at kind of an alternatives analysis. You gotta show that the facility needs to be, um, is essential to that um, serving that need. And it also needs to be located there, right? It can't be located somewhere else and still serve that need. So we're asking them to go through a several tiered analysis to really get at um, the necessity of a specific project. What's important to note here, and usually I usually I underline on the on the, the slides just to really drive the point home, is that the, the need served 
needs to be the need of the individuals in the overburdened community. It's not a general need. It's not a general societal need. You talk about recycling. You talk about solid waste. Like those all serve a need for everyone. But if it's if this particular project that is seeking the compelling public interest exception is not directly serving the needs of the community, it is not suitable. So what we're really talking about here is a focus on public work type projects um, that are necessary to serve those those individuals in the overburdened community, such that might re directly reduce stressors. We have you know combined sewer overflows. There are going to be a lot of projects that potentially. Um, implicate the environmental justice rules um, in communities, those projects that are going to ultimately reduce CSOs, reduce those overflows, reduce potential um, impacts to water quality um, and flooding. We want those We want those projects to occur. We want them to be subject to the appropriate conditions. But this is the way in which those projects, um, to the extent they are otherwise um, subject to this rule, um, that's their path to move forward, is to seek a compelling public interest exception. Now, the other thing that, that generated a lot of controversy on our end um, was the exclusion of economic benefits of the proposed facility. That includes employment, tax revenue, um, rateables, all of those things. The rules specifically say we're not going to consider those um, as a basis to serve compelling public interest, again, to really avoid um, the creation of that loophole. So that's a very brief overview of the rules. Going to hang around. We'll have you know some Q&A later um, with the other panelists. I'm really excited to hear their stuff. But um, if you're interested, check out our website. Um, we have all of this information, this PowerPoint, um, links to EJ Mass, the rule, the whole thing there. Um, and if you're looking to do this in any of your states or your local communities, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to provide our assistance. So thank you for the time and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much, Sean, for that. And um, I think, um, you know, when they say this is a landmark effort, um, I think, um, you know, we, we just, it, there's so much to, um, you know, what has been happening in New Jersey that we can all learn from. So next we will uh, have Megan Cunningham, uh, who's the managing deputy commissioner from the Department of uh, Chicago Department of Public Health and Ellis Watkins from the Environmental Law and Policy Center. They are responsible, as I said, uh, for the use of health impact assessment to inform a permit uh, denial decision in the RMG General Iron uh, Recycling Permit case um, and are building on that uh, experience to develop citywide cumulative impact assessments uh, as well as an ordinance. Um, and uh, as part of that effort or in addition to that effort, uh, they're beginning to tackle the critical issue of zoning. Um, when I invited Megan to speak, uh, she said that uh, CDPH wants to live by their core values of co-governance, co-design, and shared le share leadership and authentic engagement, and wherever possible, uh, co-present with a community partner. So I will turn it over to you, um, Megan and Ellis. Thank you so much, Charles. It is truly an honor to be with you all today, and particularly in the company of colleagues from New Jersey and Minnesota, uh, to whom we owe a real debt of gratitude in this work. You all have laid a foundation for what we are attempting to do here in the city of Chicago. Um, so we're going to spend just a few minutes today together talking about a background on environmental justice in our city, which has really formed the, the basis for our deep commitment now to transforming the way that our think our, a way that our city thinks about where and how development happens. Uh, we'll talk about our cumulative impact assessment process. And I think some hallmarks for us, as, as Charles has said, has been a real focus on how do we bring community voice and power into this work. Uh, and then also, how do we take a whole government approach? recognizing that my department is limited in the scope of our authorities um, and what we can do at the point of permitting or enforcement. And that if we're serious about changing conditions on the ground for environmental justice neighborhoods, it really takes a, a collaboration and a partnership with our city departments and sister agencies and all levels of government uh, to advance some of the reforms and recommendations that our cumulative impact assessment will recommend. And then we'll wrap up with just some high level lessons learned that may uh, assist all of you as you are planning and implementing work in your spaces. So I'm going to turn it over to Ellis for some background on environmental justice in Chicago. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'd sound pretty clear to everyone. Great. So hello, everyone. Ellis Walton, Associate Attorney for the Environmental Law and Policy Center, and I also serve as the co-chair for the policy working group. Um, responsible for uh, designing the
the uh, draft ordinance that we, we plan on submitting. So um, environmental justice in Chicago, um, just there's a long history of environmental justice activism. Um, Chicago is the home of Hazel Johnson, who is known to some or to many as uh, the mother of environmental justice. She was one of the first people, uh, one of the first activists to highlight the the burden of uh, cumulative, the cumulative pollution burden that uh, communities of color experience. Um, but she highlighted that through her experiences in all Gale Gardens on the uh, south side of Chicago. And um, just cumulative, uh, cumulative uh, impacts and cumulative burdens has been a, a, a recurring theme, especially in the last few years in Chicago. Um, the fight against um, against receiving industry um, ha has been long fought, but in recent times we've started to finally see um, some some successes in terms of changing the policy narrative and um, putting institutional power behind communities. Next slide, please. And so, like I said, uh, the cumulative burden. Um, one of the cumulative burdens that's been sort of highlighted in, in the last few years was the fight with General Iron, um, the relocation of an industrial facility from the north side of Chicago, the northwest side, um, all the way down to the southeast side. And um, as you see through this map, um, uh, this shows that this cumulative burden that communities of color in Chicago are that they experience. Um, the red is the more extreme um, burdens of of pollution and those south and west sides are uh, the communities that bear the brunt of a lot of the industrial activities in Chicago and those are the communities that we're trying to to protect and to sort of remedy that harm um, that's existed for so long and um, as I said uh, with the general iron um, sort of saw the fight against General Iron that, that's been taking place for the last few years. Um, activists from uh, uh, different organizations that you see in this graphic were able to get the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to sort of step in and um, get the city of Chicago to recognize the um, how, how permitting practices have sort of a uh, 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 centered and distributed polluting activities in these south and west sides. And so um, with that, with that, um, the, the administrative complaint with HUD, we were able to have uh, a settlement between the city, between the activists and, 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 and HUD, and uh, they were able to formulate this initiative to address this cumulative burden that communities of color are experiencing in Chicago. And um, that is this Chicago uh, Cumulative Impacts Initiative. So right now we are in the Cumulative Impact Assessment phase. And that phase is um, mainly just trying to understand the whole problem itself, looking at best practices and addressing the problem. Um, and we then hope to transition into the policy phase um, in the next few months where we have concrete policy of what we want to see for the city of Chicago what we would like for the city to implement. And, and then we would go into the policy implementation phase. Next slide, please. So our, the goal of our cumulative impacts assessment is first to provide data on where pollution is coming from, how the burdens vary across Chicago, who receives those, uh, those pollution burdens. And of course we know um, it's communities of colors. Um, we also want to inform decision-making in the land use, zoning, transportation, permitting, and enforcement processes that happens with the city and um, in the way that the city agencies and departments function. Uh, we'd also want to, like I said before, uh, co-design and lead this project with the communities who have been experiencing this overburden, um, this, this overburden reality of, of, of pollution. And so uh, throughout this process, we've been uh, trying to make sure that there is parity between um, not only the city and its agencies, but also our community partners and technical experts and policy experts. So we could all use our skills, our power, um, and our reality to um, create a, a better lived experience for the most vulnerable communities. Next slide, please. 
And so this is just a timeline of our initiative. Um, last year, um, starting in May through December, we were so, sort of in the introductory phase where we are structuring the project. We are uh, picking what sort of groups we would like to be a part of, and I'll get into the groups in a second, as well as um, researching, um, well, re yeah, researching best practices, as well as looking for existing community input on what we like to see, on what they'd like to see from us. And then we moved into our assessment phase where we then begin uh, um, sifting out the different best practices that we like to see in Chicago. We then um, start to develop um, different methodologies and indicators to understand um, the burdens, um, the pollution environmental burdens and socioeconomic burdens that exist across the city. And um, now in September, we're looking at publishing all of our findings and policy recommendations for the public to view and to also inform um, the, the, the ordinance that we plan on presenting next month. So the structure of our cumulative impacts um, assessment initiative, um, we have, I would say, three subgroups um, and those, uh, or maybe four, I'm, I might be wrong. But so the first the first group is the um, policy working group, which I co-chair. Uh, we are responsible for researching best practices for environmental justice and cumulative impacts um, initiatives nationally and sort of um, synthesizing that information and presenting it to the broader group to inform our policy um, recommendations. We uh, also have the community engagement um, uh, working group, which is responsible for determining how we would like to engage with the public, how we would like to inform the, the public, um, as well as just overarching strategy of keeping the public involved and making sure that their input is reflected, not only in our process of operating, but also the work product. Um, and then we also have um, Interdepartmental Working Group, which is a, a coalition of Chicago departments and agencies that work together to um, identify environmental justice policies that they can implement uh, with, with their current um, statutory power. As well, as well as an overarching project management team to uh, just sort of run the, uh, to serve as administrative um, um, executives of like managing the project. Um, and these are our partners over here to the right as well. Like I said, we are a mix of government partners, community partners, and um, bigger green nonprofits all working towards a common goal. Yes, and so, uh, like I said before, we've been trying to make sure that community, uh, the community voice is centered in our approach and that the policy recommendations that we propose ultimately reflect what the community, um, what the greater Chicago community wants from us, but especially the overburdened communities. And so we had um, three in-person sessions, um, I believe, last month and in, in, in July to sort of ex, uh, present what we're doing to the overall public, but also to solicit their feedback and to understand what they want from us, how we can do better, and, um, and, and what more do we need? And so uh, that was successful. We had um, three larger in-person sessions as well as different tabling events where we were able to explain to the public. And the city also hosted a public comment period um, in July where they got feedback on the EJ departmental action plans as well as our policy recommendations. So, um, Throughout the different community engagement events, we were collecting tons and tons of feedback. Um, it was really good to um, just hear back from the community to see what they wanted from us. And they really enjoyed the fact that um, the city of Chicago came to them and really listened and um, and, and and had those, those hard conversations with them. Um, a lot of people saw it as a first step um, and something that de doesn't usually happen, um, but it was it was great to see. And so we broke down the different themes of our community feedback 
Uh, the first was um, environmental justice focus areas. So that is just them wanting to make sure that we are prioritizing environmental justice areas over burning communities. The second was um, environmental health outcomes associated with pollution exposure. And that is making sure we're attentive to how the effects of, uh, of exposure to, uh, to pollution, um, how that creates um, chronic illnesses or, or influences the um, chronic illnesses in communities of color. Um, the third is the socioeconomic impact associated with polluting facilities. So looking at that, um, looking at how the decision-making process is inequitable and, and, and leans towards industry versus community as well as um, just overall general community recommendations that they would like for the city to, to implement to, to better their, the communities that they live in, or at least to better the experience and in, in, in their reality. Next slide, please. Okay, and I see we're getting a five minute warning. So I'm gonna move us quickly through these next sections and then we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, so what Ellis has shared with you is the process by which we conducted our cumulative impact assessment. We're meeting each other just a week or so too early um, because we are about ready to publicly release our Chicago environmental justice neighborhood map. Um, but what I can tell you in sort of a, a preview mode today is that we have created uh, a very similar index to the Cal Enviro screen and work that New Jersey has done. Uh, where we have taken into account measures of pollution burden as well as population characteristics to create a map of Chicago so that we better understand where are the neighborhoods that are most vulnerable to the impacts of pollution. And these are the places where we intend to put in place these new policy protections. Um, like New Jersey and others, we will have a public facing data dashboard and more detailed methodology documentation that we will be releasing by the end of this year and in early 2024. Another important deliverable of the cumulative impact assessment is our product of the interdepartmental environmental justice working group, which included 12 city departments. Um, so we had our teams working on transportation and land use and development. We had people from uh, water management, from procurement services, who all asked themselves what they could do within the scope of their existing department authorities and with current resources to better protect environmental justice neighborhoods from harm. And so we have formalized all of this now in a city of Chicago environmental justice action plan that contains dozens of strategies meant to accomplish our citywide environmental justice goal, which you can see on this slide. Uh, some specific examples coming out of this process are uh, to expand our community hyperlocal air monitoring network in EJ neighborhoods so that we have better and more real time data. Uh, changing the way that we do transportation planning and particularly routing of trucks in EJ areas, adopting strengthened industry specific rules, uh, making reforms to how the city conducts its contracting process and adding environmental and health protections, particularly in city commodities contracts, uh, addressing stormwater infrastructure in EJ neighborhoods and many more. So this is how we are attempting to really model taking a whole government approach now that we have better data about where uh, environmental justice neighborhoods are in Chicago. Uh, we, we see this as an important step forward in terms of strengthening those local protections. And then, of course, all of this is really building towards ultimately ordinance change for the city. Uh, and so Ellis has shared with us uh, some detail about how we conducted national landscape scan and research on places like New Jersey and, and Minnesota and California and others uh, to really identify three main areas of policy action. Uh, we call these environmental justice fundamentals, cumulative impacts elements, and community benefits. The target here is to create new standard governance systems and structures within the city of Chicago uh, that create formalized advisory bodies that um, contain representatives from communities that are affected by EJ issues, uh, that give them power in decision making, that strengthen community engagement standards, um, and that formalize the, the cumulative impact assessment and allow us to apply it in how the city conducts its business. 
With cumulative impacts elements, we are intending to move in the, the direction of, of other jurisdictions in requiring the city to consider a broader host of environmental health and social stressors in decision making. Um, and we do intend to do that at both the point of zoning as well as the point of permitting. Um, we, we find that we do have more flexibility in the kinds of requirements that we are able to impose upon businesses or authorities to deny permits at the point of, of zoning. Um, and we think it is important that as we are conducting land use planning with an eye towards addressing cumulative impacts, um, that that's, that is a site of really uh, initial engagement and point of intervention. Like New Jersey, we will be establishing thresholds that will be applied in our decision making based on impacts. Um, and then we are also very focused on not just how do we minimize burdens, but how do we create benefits for people who live in EJ neighborhoods? So policy recommendations um, and what we hope to advance soon here in Chicago there are the establishment of funds that can be used specifically for these areas on locally determined projects that can create uh, local wealth, that can create local green infrastructure, that can promote neighborhood resiliency. Um, and we do believe that communities should have agency and ownership over these, these benefits. Very briefly then, some lessons learned. You've heard us repeat this a number of times in today's conversation, but leadership with our values of being affirmatively anti-racist, focused on equity, uh, accountable and transparent, uh, and recognizing that a process like this uh, takes a lot of time because it is really about building trust and repairing harm. Uh, we've really emphasized this whole government approach so that we can tackle comprehensively the root causes and drivers of cumul cumulative impacts. Um, we are really trying to incorporate this sort of lived experience data as data in the cumulative impact assessment and to think about ways that ground truthing continues to play a role in this work. And finally, a place where community members and industry representatives certainly have agreed in this process is that they expect policies to be clear, that minimize the administrative burdens, and that are applied consistently and fairly. And so our goal in this next phase of work as we move from policy recommendations to implementation is to ensure that the rules of the road are clearly communicated and understood by all of our stakeholders. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit our website, chicago.gov slash cumulative impact. Uh, there will be a lot more there next week. So we encourage you uh, to continue to follow along and feel free to reach out to us with questions. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, uh, Megan and Ellis. What a great presentation. Uh, there is so much going on there. Um, I told the staff of CDPH that uh, what they were doing is really um, um, his, um, uh, making history. Uh, so now we are going to go to our last set of speakers, um, who arguably should have been first, because Christy Allison was responsible for writing the first ever uh, set of protocols for assessing uh, cumulative levels and effects for air permits as a result of the 2008 Minnesota legislation. She is presently uh, working uh, for the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, doing research on, to, on how to better incorporate um, community uh, experience in the uh, community knowledge and experience in uh, cumulative impact assessment. Uh, she will be joined by her uh, community partner, Sasha Lewis uh, Norell. Um, they not only will provide details about uh, the early efforts, but reflect on what they have learned from uh, New Jersey, Chicago, and other places to advance current efforts to advance cumulative impacts uh, in the state of Minnesota. So um, uh, Christy and uh, Sasha, I'll turn it over to you. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Uh, yes you can put on Put it on. Uh, yeah. Oh, OK, right. so I'm going to start um, again. Christy Ellickson, Union of Concerned Scientists. I'm going to talk through um, an older law and then um, Sasha is going to present on the current work for the new law that passed um, this past legislative session in 2023. So thanks for joining us. Happy Tuesday. Um, you know, the the situation we're in right now and, and the state of Minnesota, specifically you're looking at the city of Minneapolis, is no different. There were um, racially biased systems that put communities of color in proximity to high sources of pollutant burden. And that wasn't, you know, it wasn't a mistake. It was on purpose. It was an intentional um, system that was set up. And um, you can see that that carries through 
to the present. We still have these um, high proximity, I mean, um, proximity of high pollution burden near communities of color and low income communities in the city of, in the city of Minneapolis. And um, in order to alleviate the situation, um, it requires system change. And I believe that cumulative impacts laws, ordinances and rules are one of those systems changes that could potentially alleviate this this situation. So in early 2008, I believe there was a proposal for a biomass um, combustion facility to create steam and electricity in an already overburdened neighborhood. And there was a lot of opposition to that proposal. And part of the opposition built up support for a law that was passed, I believe in 2009. I'm sorry if I'm going to get my law, my years incorrect, but um, so passed in 2009, the wording of the law itself um, specifically specifically addressed permitting, was related to permitting, specifically air permitting, possibly solid waste permitting and other types of permitting, but mainly air permitting and required an analysis. The analysis had to look at the context around a facility. Um, and, and it required that that analysis was considered when the permit was considered. So that is the decision-making language we're working with in 2009. So um, an air permit engineer and myself were tasked as, um, as staff at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency at the time to, um, to develop a method, do communication around it, get feedback from the community and so forth, and then implement the method with the two first two permits that went through in this area. And I should say it's a state statute, it's a little unique. So it's a state statute, but it only applied to a, an area of South Minneapolis. And that was done through negotiation in the legislative session when it passed. Um, so what we did is we set it up with the tools available to us at the time. Um, California, just to give you a state of time, California was currently developing EJ screen. So we were watching those webcasted um, meetings where they were defining cumulative impacts and developing EJ screen and so forth. It was, it was a, an exciting time. So we set it up with the tools that the agency had at the time, you know, the air pollution computer modeling to look at all the emissions from an air emission source and then estimate levels nearby at the fence line or, or out, you know, to look at levels of, of um, air pollution concentrations and then estimate health effects. So it was that old school classic paradigm of risk assessment. Um, so then we would look at the pollutants that came from a facility that was under this law. And um, if they were over a certain level, we would include them in the analysis. The levels we set were uh, 10% of toxicity values that we, we were using at the time, or a level lower than, a, than one of the criteria pollutant standards. Okay, so each of those pollutants, so now we have a, a bunch of pollutants that are included in the analysis, but it has to be cumulative, you remember. So we looked at the health endpoints that were aligned with those pollutants, and that's the way we pulled in the cumulative data. So those other public health stressors, social adversity stressors, other chemical stressors. So we looked at so um, we looked at the health endpoints. Health endpoint. What I mean is like a respiratory irritant or a carcinogen, et cetera. And any other type of data that was publicly available at the time, um, accessible to us, we pulled in as a part of a report. And then that report was used. Um, in the in the determination of the permit okay so that was our process at the time lessons learned from this process one of the things we built in was were information sessions before agency technical review and that was uncomfortable at the time but very important because it helped provide an informal setting where you sit down and you talk about the process. What's going to happen? Who are the people reviewing the work? Um, what else should we know about the neighborhood? What other data might be available? We scoped by um, pollutant and health endpoint. That joining by health endpoint worked for us at the time. 
we got permit limits um, be, to avoid more analysis. So that was a, a win of, the, of that older law. Um, so some facilities would take permit limits to avoid, say, having a certain health endpoint carry through and, you know, be required to, to pull in data around that health endpoint. You know, and at the time we didn't have the cumulative impacts in the EJ um, online mapping tools like like they have now, I was literally emailing the health department to ask for small gestational age data or asthma data. And now Minnesota has a really nice um, public health data tool and and some more and you know environmental justice type screening tools available to them. So that was what we were doing then. Uh, and I think one of the benefits of that early law was it required decision makers to see a facility context outside of um, outside of maybe that process flow diagram or you know whatever whatever you're used to looking at or the or the applicability of different rules you were seeing the neighborhood um, you were seeing the facility not as isolated but in the context of the community challenges to fix and this is where we're going to transition to the new law there was no definition of cumulative impacts provided. We use the intent of the legislative authors and we use the words of the of the of the law to develop this analysis. So we did a lot of inferring, you know. Um, the decision making criteria was consider. It was not a priori, it was not direct. Um, it was not the comparative analysis that New Jersey is working on right now, which, which is very intriguing and seems very actionable. Um, there, we did not at the time include community engagement in scoping. When we had those information sessions, the analysis was already drafted. So we weren't, um, we didn't set up a process at the time to allow community members to talk about maybe health endpoints they were very concerned about or saw a lot in their neighborhood. And that's a regret. Um, there was no data tool. Like I said, you know, if you have a data tool, like an EJ map, you're, you're maybe, I don't know, 55% of the way there. Um, no, and there was no permit denial or limiting authority. And now I am going to stop talking and Sasha is going to start talking about the new law. All right. Thank you, Christy. Um, so I've got about four and a half minutes to get through this. So I'll go quick um, so we can have time for Q&A. Um, yeah, so as Christy said, this law passed earlier this year in the 2023 legislative session. Um, it was the culmination of a number of years of work um, back in like 2018. The local group community members from environmental justice brought this up again um, with the hope of expanding on cumulative impacts, um, both work that had done uh, that had been done previously that Christy mentioned, and also being inspired by work that was being done in places like New Jersey. Um, you know, wanting to expand this kind of work to, at the very least, North Minneapolis, which is another um, very overburdened community, and hopefully also cover places across the entire state. Um, so in terms of the law that was passed, um, it does have some uh, limitations as well, especially given the um, pretty severe political divide between urban and rural Minnesota. Um, and so this law covers environmental justice areas with the same definition that New Jersey uses um, in terms of census tracts, um, using the same criteria, um, but it only covers the seven county metro area, so the Twin Cities area, as well as Rochester and Duluth, um, the two other largest cities in Minnesota. Um, and then the tribes are able to, um, you know, have this impact their land as well if they desire it. Um, it's a bit complicated there because they are sovereign nations, so they usually go through the federal government, um, but they would be able to use methods um, similar to what the MPCA is going to be using uh, for this law. Uh, this law also covers, um, you know, a lot of the same air permits in terms of uh, it focuses on, you know, a lot of the larger air permits um, that are actually having an impact on the local health or environment of communities. Um, it also covers both new and existing facilities. Um, and so it's basically whenever a new facility or um, a, a facility is expanding or getting their permit reissued, um, they would potentially have to do this cumulative impacts analysis. Um, it also covers facilities that are not just within the census tracts themselves, but are uh, within one mile of those census tracts, because we know that air pollution does not just stay in one area. Um, and if a facility is, you know, right next to a census tract, then we want it to be able to um, have this analysis done in case that it is harming one of these areas. Um, 
And then the way that our uh, permit denial works is um, it will define uh, within rulemaking substantial adverse impact. Um, and then if a facility meets that criteria, um, then it would either have to have its permit denied or it would enter into a community benefit agreement. Um, and this is an area that um, we had been pushing for language that was similar to New Jersey in terms of um, meeting a compelling public interest. Um, but a community benefit agreement is the language that was ultimately decided upon during the legislative session. Um, and so a facility would do an analysis if they meet criteria of um, certain benchmarks. Um, so that's part of the scoping where uh, we're really targeting like the medium and large polluters um, and you know also targeting facilities that are in like very overburned communities. Um, and so during rulemaking, they will lay out these criteria for when a facility must do this analysis. Um, and then they would, uh, you know, do a similar analysis to what like New Jersey and other places do, um, looking at a lot of the context, um, that part is still being laid out within the rulemaking itself. Um, and if it meets that uh, criteria of substantial adverse cumulative impact, then it would either have to be denied or they would have to enter into a community benefit agreement. Um, the process of which will also be defined in rulemaking. And with that part, we're really trying to highlight that community members should be able to determine if they want a facility to um, you know, be given that permit and to enter into a community benefit agreement. Next slide, please. And so the rulemaking uh, started earlier this year um, in July and will go um, as a deadline of May 24th, 2026. Um, they're currently doing public engagement um, starting today. Well, they started with a, a a comment period, and they're also having uh, public meetings starting today um, with a number coming up this month. Um, and then most of next year will be really the rural development process. We're really pushing for the agency to bring community members and community leaders into the process and to you know, work collaboratively to create this rule in a way that will strike the balance of um, adding additional protections and also empowering communities um, and you know, giving them the tools to either reject permits or, um, you know, if they're going to be taking on additional pollution, then making sure that they are really getting the benefits um, and that they, you know, agree to that because they want those sorts of benefits. Next. And just to quickly wrap up with the lessons that we learned, um, we had a lot of different organizations that were involved in pushing for this, and it took a number of different years. Um, I think that we could have also done better with like building power across the state. A lot of our organizations are primarily based in the Twin Cities, um, and that you know made it more difficult to push for this law to cover the entire state. Um, but we did have really good rapid response in terms of being able to respond to the um, how quickly our legislative session moved. We had strong legal support to make sure that the language that was passed um, you know, was very clear on exactly what needed to be done. Um, this is a lesson that we learned from the, the previous law in uh, 2009, where again, like a lot of that language was pretty vague and uh, required a lot of rulemaking for um, interpretation. Um, and we also wanted to make sure that we covered existing permits and facilities um, because you know, this is a law that should you know, stop new sources of pollution and also reduce current sources of pollution. Uh, and for challenges ahead, uh, you know, we need to set these benchmarks in a way that, um, you know, covers the right facilities and make sure that certain facilities are uh, having this analysis done and that also has a reasonable benchmark for um, permit denial, uh, that community benefit agreements um, are going to have, you know, clear terms that will actually benefit the direct community and that community can also reject those terms if they feel like they're just not worth it to take on that additional pollution. Um, and also doing our best to make sure that community members are given the resources um, that they can properly engage with this process that, you know, has often been very exclusive um, because this is, again, a process that we want to uh, make very community led and make sure that they are being brought into intentionally into this whole process. And I think that wraps everything up, uh, uh, everything up for us. Great. Great. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. And, uh, and uh, um, and uh and sasha and uh, uh i guess a huge round of applause uh i guess some way of doing that for all these presentations i think that you know um this is a is really a, a snapshot into a history being made um and i think we're going to ask people to um to um uh uh to um uh, to ask questions on the chat. Um, and so as I'm waiting for them, I wanted to also uh, note that um, um, Laura August and uh, Walker Whelan from the Office of Health Impact Asse 
uh, environmental health impact assessment from California EPA is in the audience. I have wanted them to say a few words uh, just to make sure we all understand where a lot of this came from, um, but I don't think that's possible. But in any event, you know, I want to make sure you all recognize uh, the role and the place that uh, Cal and viral screen played in the historical development of cumulative impact assessment. Uh, uh, so, um, the, um, I don't know, the first question we'll be fielding is the ch chat is for uh, Deputy Commissioner Moriarty. Uh, did I catch that? Um, I don't see a question there. Okay, I have one for um, the um, for uh, for Sean, and uh, this is something I've been thinking about a long time, um, and I think one of the um, hallmarks uh, and something that's not yet appreciated is that in New Jersey they're not really doing a quote unquote cumulative impact assessment in the traditional sense; they're doing a disproportionate impact analysis in a cumulative manner. And so, Sean, how do you? What do you think? the idea that you're required to, to have equity be a consideration, um, uh, play, what, what role do you think that played uh, in, being, in your being able to do the analysis that you have, you, uh, you've been able to uh, develop? Sure, yeah, no, um, that's a, I, like the way, I like the way you termed that, Charles, I'm gonna start stealing that now, disproportionate <laughs> cumulative um, component. So, um, you know, I think when we, when we, when the law law was signed and as we were negotiating it, um, I think as we looked at some of the other the other tools out there and began to consider what would make most sense um, from a regulatory perspective, what we really wanted to do was try to simplify the analysis as much as possible um, to insulate from challenge, right? We're, we're being sued on the rules as as they currently exist anyway, so I'm not sure how much, how much insulation we provided, but from a process perspective and from a reliability perspective, um, we tried to kind of stay away from waiting, stay away from kind of some of the other um, hallmarks of, of a, like a true cumulative impacts analysis. In doing that, we engage really, um, really deeply with our stakeholders, particularly kind of our, our prominent environmental justice advocates, Nikki Sheets, uh, um, Maria, um, Anna Batista, like uh, Kim Gaddy, like some folks who are, you know, been steeped in this and ultimately are, you know, as responsible as anyone, including the legislature for getting this law passed. Um, we kind of engage with them on, you know, what makes sense from your perspective to get at, to get at an equity, to get at kind of an accurate comparison and where we really landed. And I think, you know, some pretty detailed conversations with Dr. Sheets, um, landing at that kind of 50th percentile as being the key part of the, of the comparative analysis, um, pushing that, you know, down as low as possible, um, to maintain consistency with the statutory requirement that we determine where um, stressors are quote unquote higher than we think that when you when you apply that um, pick the correct number of stressors um, and then kind of stack them the way we stack them um, I think you get at you know really really robust coverage of overburdened communities in the state um, while allowing us to really focus on the ones that are most in need of those different protections Great, hey, thank you, Sean. Um, I wanted to kind of pursue the same line of um, of question uh, quickly. Uh, this is for um, uh, for Megan and Ellis. Um, I know that the um, uh, cumulative impact assessment process uh, 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 in Chicago took place uh, with uh, the idea of a uh, healthy Chicago 20, 2025, which is um, you know seeking to ensure that um, equity is being considered. So how do you think that played in the way that, how did that shape your thinking in terms of developing or doing the health impact assessment and future activ uh, and further activities? Yeah, thank you for the question, Charles. And maybe I'll answer it in a way that touches on some of the questions I see in the chat as well. Um, so Healthy Chicago 2025 is really about how we address the root causes of health to create optimal conditions and environments for people to live healthy lives. And a big part of that is about community power and capacity building. And so as we have thought about equity and outcome, we have also thought about equity in process. And that's why it was so important to us to share with you the journey that we've taken with our environmental justice organization partners. 
Um, when we think about equity and outcome, I see some questions in the chat related to why we're creating our own Chicago specific tool and not just relying on sort of state or national resources, which are becoming much better over time as the field advances. I think the answer to that is sort of twofold. One is again, that the process mattered, right? We wanted our community partners, our government entity partners to feel real ownership over the data. Um, and so we wanted to be able to choose the, the, the burdens that mattered most to our neighborhoods. We wanted to apply hyper-local data sources, including an annual health survey that the health department administers here in the city of Chicago. And we wanted to really design the methodology together um, and then create mapping tools that followed from that. So it was really in that spirit of community co-design and co-ownership um, and with an eye towards then how we make sure that we're capturing the right variables to track progress over time. I see also a question about um, the measuring the public health co-benefits and whether we have um, identified measures of positive impacts. Um, we do intend to create an EJ scorecard for the city of Chicago. Um, again, kind of looking at some of these national models, our interdepartmental environmental justice group will be working with our EJ collaborators to identify those measures and to track them publicly and transparently as part of our commitment to ongoing accountability uh, to not just reducing burdens, but also showing long-term public health benefits and outcomes. Um, and much of that will live on our website, health, uh, the chicagohealthatlas.org. We can put that in the chat if any of you are interested in seeing kind of how that module um, is being built out over time. Great. Thank you, Megan. Um, yeah, and I want to apologize. I didn't realize I had to move over to the comments uh, box uh, in order to see the questions, so I overlooked them. Um, one of them is from uh, Dee Williams, and uh, it is for Sean, I think. What are the strategies that you use to get legislators on board? Sure. So, I mean, first and foremost, um, you know, there, you know, our law comes, as, as I imagine, many, many states and, and, and local localities. It comes, you know, after years and years and years of efforts um, by our environmental justice advocates. And I think that, you know, that's the first, the first thing, There's a decade plus in the making um, to get us in a position to even have a law to, to pass. Right. So like the first, that, that is the primary thing. That's, that's how you get them on board is continued um, direct um, and frankly, um, untiring, ad, untiring advocacy. From the department's perspective, I think there were two specific things that helped. One, we understood that this advocacy was was happening for a long time. We had folks in our building who had done some of the legwork and the groundwork on our side to begin to conceptualize and visualize what a comparative um, impact analysis would look like for the state. So we were able to, um, as part of that legislative process, demonstrate certain things about you know you know taking specific facilities, looking at them on a density basis, making those points of comparison, so folks could see what the specific definitions and standards that were being proposed would actually look like um, for the state of New Jersey. I think that was critical, having that data um, ahead um, ahead of time. And the second piece, and I think the, the biggest point of negotiation um, between the business community and the legislature and you know the advocates in the department was around what the department's specific authorities would be with regard to new facilities versus existing facilities. We, um, the original version of our bill um, would have um, required a denial for renewals of existing facilities. That was a, that ended up being a, you know a fairly significant and meaningful give back um, in quotes to the business community to address some of their concerns about the the continued ability for um, for uh, facilities to operate. Right. So taking that from a denial to a condition, um, I think really kind of um, addressed the last like really really critical concern on their end and took away a lot of the steam um, that they would have had from an opposite oppositional perspective. Um, we have the ability to, to put significant conditions in. Um, the business community is now mad at us for putting too many conditions in, right? So we've done our job in some way to try to make that that um, really meaningful from a regulatory perspective. Um, and, you know, I, I think the last thing to say is that just the, the political climate at the time um, in summer of 2020 was was right for, for action, right? And we were fortunate in some way um, that the legislature was positioned as a result of these other, this, this advanced advocacy um, to be able to take a meaningful step forward um, in environmental justice. Thank you, Sean. And I think uh, I wanna, we're getting close to 
um, the end um, of the session. So I just wanted to um, ask this, uh, pose this question to Christy Ellickson. And Christy, you said that, um, you know, the idea of being able to do a comparative analysis uh, was really intriguing to you, you know. And uh, so I just wanted you to talk about from the context of your experience with MPCA and the Minnesota uh, regulations um, and, uh, you know, in your general knowledge of the issue, uh, what did you mean by that? Well, I think we're trying to address disproportionate impacts and burden. And so one of, I mean, you have to have a comparative analysis to do that. You, it just is inherent in the question. And so you're trying to, to lower these, to decrease these gaps and lower what's already there. Those two things, you don't want to add more to already overburdened areas and you want to decrease what's there. And so I think it's hard to answer that question because it's just so clear to me that it's necessary. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think, um, you know, I, I think one of the things, I mean, so I just speak for myself. I think, you know, um, New Jersey's uh, approach has been a real gift to us because what it does is um, it, it, it speaks to so many of these questions about the nature of the cumulative impact issue. But because they're able to do a, a comparative analysis, it gets to be something, a result that could be actionable. And uh, if there's one message I would like to leave with everyone in thinking about, you know, what this conversation means for lessons about what makes for successful cumulative impact assessment um, and action, um, it is that probably one, that's one point that I would want to leave. Uh, for people to reflect on, you know, what I would call the requirement or the uh, mandate uh, to um, to consider equity as part of the of the assessment process, I think is a really, really key strategic idea. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the um, things I will leave with people is that Columbia University Sabin Environmental Law Center has come out with a set of model legislation around cumulative impacts. Um, and, you know, New Jersey's, of course, was one of those they mentioned, but I don't think yet that we fully understood why that's the case. So, um, you know, so I just want to kind of leave that in terms of my own editorial comment at the very end of the session. I want to thank uh, the um, everyone for, um, for participating. And I want to really thank, um, you know, the speakers today, um, you know, I know there was a lot of enthusiasm about this session, and it is because of the work that they've been doing uh, that really is uh, uh, giving us, um, you know, some pathways forward uh, that we should all reflect upon. So thank you so much for being part of, of the of the of the session. A round of applause again for the for our speakers, and I wish everyone uh, a wonderful afternoon. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Charles. Thanks, Alex.